welcome again from me. I'm Dr. Fisher. Hi, and I'm Dr. Newton. Nice to see you again. I want to begin this week with a big shout out to the Lenora Ryan University Library. Those of you who have visited our course page may have noticed that there's a link at the top for more resources, and that's a site that the library has put together for us. So they have done an awesome job, and we just want to thank them for that. I want to remind you as well of the format tonight. We'll begin with our um, guest professor, Dr. Daniel Grimm, uh, who will speak for about 10 minutes. Um, Dr. Newton and I will have a few questions for him, and then we will turn the questions over to our audience. Um, and we invite you to submit questions both through Dr. Graham's presentation, but then through the whole thing on the Q&A feed, there's a button at the bottom of your screen. One of the things that we wanted to um, briefly talk about at the very beginning here this week um, was we spent some time last week um, talking about um, inequities in the healthcare system as one of the reasons why um, there's a, a difference in um, the rates of infection and death for COVID-19 among people of color um, and, and white people. Um, and one of our students in the class in our survey that we sent out on Sunday very rightly pointed out um, that it's clear why we have these inequities in the health system, that one of the largest uh, factors for that inequity is systematic racism. And this dovetailed, this pointing out, it, it dovetailed nicely with the experience that we as um, facilitators and many of the guest professors who were working with this summer, uh, an experience that we had was that it was a little bit hard this week uh, in light of ongoing uh, events around the nation to focus on uh, coronavirus, although it is still uh, an unfolding emergency, um, other more urgent events kind of took the spotlight in news this week. Um, so we wanted to very uh, briefly uh, talk about that. Um, including the, the best advice that I've been given uh, about uh, the protests um, is to be humble enough to have curiosity about the per, uh, perspectives as well as the experiences of other people. Um, and of course, that humility to be curious goes both ways. Um, but if at this moment, the phrase Black Lives Matter uh, makes you feel angry or defensive, uh, we would like to encourage you to ask honest questions and explore that and listen well to the answers that are given in response to those questions. And we hope that you can let your curiosity lead the way uh, to a better understanding of the events that are unfolding around our nation today. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we'll be returning to these themes as the course goes along, this weird intersection of events that on the one hand seems so not like each other, but have roots in some of the same issues. Um, we want to respect your time tonight and as, as every week. So we will end the session tonight promptly at eight o'clock. That means we may not get to all of the questions, um, but we do want to make the conversation, not make the conversation committee. We, we hope that the conversation will continue. So after the session, we're going to make the video available on the class YouTube site and we can continue questions on that platform. So I have the pleasure this evening of introducing um, Dr. Daniel Grimm, our guest professor for this week, who is an assistant professor of biology here at LR with decades of experience as a professional researcher at many private laboratories and many universities. He earned his PhD in microbiology at North Carolina State University and uh, was also um, uh, worked on an NIH funded postdoctoral grant um, at Duke University Medical Center. And throughout his career, he was awarded multi million dollar research grants in the area of microbiology. And that is a particular emphasis of his research and his teaching. So we're very pleased to have Dr. Grimm with us here this evening. In addition to Dr. Grimm, our excellent guest professor, we also um, are honored to have Dr. Robert Esch with us here tonight. Um, Dr. Esch is going to be joining our panel for this week. He teaches immunology at Lenore Ryan University and maintains a private research laboratory in Lenore. 
He served as the chief science officer of Greer Laboratories, a healthcare company that specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of allergies through allergy immunotherapy. And during his 35 years at Greer, he served in a variety of functions in quality control, manufacturing, regulatory affairs, and research and development related to the manufacture and the development of products used for human and veterinary medicine. He earned his PhD also in microbiology and immunology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and his BS and MS degrees in bacteriology and public health from Washington State University. We are so lucky to have both of these individuals with us here today. Dr. Grimm is going to get us started off with a little bit of a lecture. Um, please, Dr. Grimm, I'm so excited to learn with you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Taylor. I really appreciate that introduction. Um, I do want to uh, let Devin know that it's not a 10-minute talk. It's more like a 20-minute talk, so I hope that doesn't throw you off too badly. Oh, that'll be just fine, actually. I okay. look forward to it. All right, well, um, hello everyone, and, and welcome to the second lecture uh, on the fundamentals of virology, a part of week two of Lenore Ryan's 10-week COVID class. Uh, as Taylor said, my name is uh, Daniel Grimm, and in this lecture, I'll be presenting a brief overview of two topics uh, in virology. First, viral replication, and then uh, vaccine production. Uh, I'll describe in broad terms how viruses, including the one responsible for COVID-19, enter a host cell, and are then replicated and released. Uh, then I'll discuss how vaccines are made. Specifically, I'll review five methods for designing a vaccine that targets the causative agent of any particular infectious disease. Uh, so the objectives of this lecture are first to describe the steps common to the replication of animal viruses, uh, both RNA and DNA animal viruses, and then to examine the principal methods by which vaccines are made. Uh, in the question and answer period following this lecture, our panel will entertain questions about viruses in general, about the SARS-CoV-2 virus specifically. We'll also answer questions about making of vaccines and the relationship between vaccine compliance and herd immunity in any given population. Uh, first recall that viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, uh, very simply composed of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, surrounded by a coat of protein, and this protein coat is referred to as a capsid. For this ultra simple microbe to multiply in a host, it must first invade the host cell, uh, and then it has to take over um, the host cell's metabolic machinery. In doing so, it will produce hundreds or thousands of copies of itself, and then induce the destruction of the host cell to release the newly formed viruses we call virions. An overview of the replication of animal viruses is shown on this slide. A list of the principal steps involved in the process can be seen on the left of the slide, and these include attachment of the virus to the host cell. The virus must then enter the host cell. Uh, after entering the separation or uncoupling of virus capsid from its DNA or RNA, known as uncoating occurs. Uh, the replication of the nucleic acid from the virus and the synthesis of the viral proteins then follows. Uh, finally, the virus assembles and is released uh, from the cell, and each newly formed virus that's released is then free to infect neighboring cells. The diagram on the right of the slide does illustrate these steps. Um, this diagram happens to use a, a DNA-containing virus for this purpose, uh, but the major steps shown here are also relevant to an RNA virus, like the COVID virus. Uh, starting at the top of the figure, replication begins with virus attachment and then entry into the host cells. You can see that in steps one and two. Uh, next, viral nucleic acid and capsid proteins separate, see that in step three, so that each is manufactured separately by the host cell, those steps shown in step four. Uh, finally, the newly synthesized virus parts are assembled and released as shown at the bottom of the figure. So now let's talk a little more about each of the steps in viral replication. First, attachment. Well, it turns out viruses have attachment sites, also known as ligands, that bind to receptor sites on the surface of their host cell. The host cell receptor sites are composed of proteins or carbohydrate protein complexes known as glycoproteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane of the cell. These receptor sites on host cells are highly specific for the attachment sites on the invading virus. 
For example, the COVID-19 virus will attach only to the ACE2 receptor on a host cell. Without the ACE2 receptor, there would be no viral attachment or replication. So if you were somehow able to block this receptor or block the equivalent attachment on the site on the virus, you could potentially prevent infection by SARS-CoV-2. Attachment sites uh, vary with each virus. Non-envelope viruses like adenoviruses, uh, cause of the common cold, have protein fibers at the corners of their polyhedron capsid that attach to the host cell receptor site. Envelope virus like the influenza virus or coronaviruses attach to host cells using a prominent protein spike that covers the surface of the envelope. This micrograph shows the location of protein fibers on non-envelope viruses like adenoviruses. These protein fibers are used to attach to the host cell. The fibers shown here are hemagglutinin fibers that can also cause clumping of red blood cells. A computer colorized electron micrograph of the COVID-19 virus is shown on this slide with the arrow indicating the envelope spikes that the COVID virus uses for binding to our host cells. Well, as it turns out, receptor sites on the host cell are inherited. This accounts in part for any individual susceptibility to a particular viral infection. This is one of the reasons that we aren't all infected with a particular strain of the influenza virus each flu season. The next step in viral infection is entry. In this step, the attached virus makes its way into the host cell, usually by one of two methods. Non-envelope viruses enter the cell by a process known as receptor-mediated endocytosis, in which the cell membrane collapses to enfold the virus and bring it into the cell, but only after the virus has attached to the cell surface. So the virus in attachment kind of rings the doorbell and the cell opens the door to let that virus in. Now, the top panel of this illustration shows a virus particle being taken up by receptor-mediated endocytosis. On the right side of the image, you can see that the plasma membrane has formed a vesicle around the virus as it brings it into the interior of the cell. Envelope viruses like the influenza virus and the COVID virus can also enter a cell by fusing its lipid envelope with the lipid in the cell membrane. The capsid containing the nucleic acid is then released into the cell cytoplasm. So that process is shown in the bottom panel of this figure, which illustrates entry of the envelope virus by that process we call fusion. You can see on the left of the image an envelope virus making contact with the host cell membrane. As it fuses with the membrane, the naked capsid is released into the cell. You can see that on the right side of the illustration. Uh, the next step in viral replication is uncoating. That's the separation of the viral capsid or its protein coat from the nucleic acid that it surrounds. Both viral and host cell enzymes make this possible. So uh, this is a truly remarkable micrograph, I think, showing the uncoating process. You can see the nucleic acid molecule, which looks like a long strand of spaghetti, indicated by the yellow arrow. The red arrow points to the empty capsid that normally contains the DNA or RNA of the virus. After uncoating, the next phase in viral replication is the biosynthesis step, in which viral nucleic acid is replicated multiple times, and then copies of the nucleic acid molecules will fill empty capsids to, complete, to make complete viruses. Individual capsid proteins are spontaneously assembled into empty capsids in the maturation phase. Then the copies of nucleic acid molecules fill the empty capsids to create complete viruses. These new viruses are then released from the host cell. Envelope viruses are released from the cell using a process called budding. The newly assembled viruses will exit the host cell by pushing through the plasma membrane. In doing so, they pick up part of the cell membrane to form the envelope around the virus. 
On the right side of this slide shows an envelope virus, the HIV virus, emerging from its host cell by that budding process. The graphic on the left illustrates that envelope viruses actually acquire their envelope from the host cell membrane. As the virus exits the host cell, it drags some of the cell membrane with it, and this creates the viral envelope. Non-envelope viruses have another way of exiting the cell. They induce cell lysis, and the, the newly formed viruses then burst out of the cell, causing the death of the cell. Here's an example of cell lysis as a means of releasing replicated viruses. This micrograph shows bacteriophages being released from their bacterial host, resulting in the destruction of this rod-shaped bacterial cell. So to recap, the replication of animal viruses, including the COVID virus, requires first a specific attachment of the virus to the host cell, followed by entry into the cell and separation of the nucleic acid from its protein coat, the so-called uncoating process. The separated viral components are then replicated independently and assembled into complete viruses before release from the cell by either budding or cell lysis. If you focus on the illustration to the right, you'll see the virus in various stages of completion during the replication process from whole viruses that you could see at the top and the bottom of the figure, to fragments or pieces of the virus being assembled in step five prior to release from the cell. So as researchers at universities or pharmaceutical companies study these various stages of virus development, they begin to get ideas of different ways to make vaccines against the virus, using either the whole virus or even pieces of the virus as a means to immunize humans against viral diseases. So next I want to explore the principal methods by which vaccines are created to prevent diseases caused by both viruses and bacteria. So I'll talk briefly about six different methods for developing vaccines. These are live attenuated vaccines, uh, killed or inactivated vaccines, subunit, conjugated and toxoid vaccines, and the newest approaches for making vaccines that use short segments of the pathogen's nucleic acid to generate viral proteins in our own cells that will bring about an immune response. Uh, let's first look at the live attenuated method for making vaccines. The word attenuation refers to the weakening or of the intact or whole pathogen to the point where it is no longer capable of producing disease. Attenuation of viruses can sometimes be accomplished just by growing them in cell culture over an extended period of time. Vaccines made from attenuated viruses mimic real infections and they produce really strong immune responses that generate antibodies to the virus and long-term memory cells that protect against future encounters with that same virus. So live attenuated vaccines are highly effective and can induce lifelong immunity without the need for booster injections. Examples of vaccines produced in this way include the chickenpox vaccine, the MMR vaccine, which protects us against measles, mumps, and rubella, and the nasal form of the influenza vaccine. Killed inactivated vaccines use viruses or bacteria that have been inactivated or killed using strong chemical compounds such as phenol or formalin. This treatment leaves the virus totally incapable of produ producing disease. Killed inactivated vaccines are generally considered safer than live attenuated vaccines, especially for children, because the method doesn't produce even a mild form of the disease. A disadvantage is that boosters are often needed to sustain protective levels of immunity because of the lack of long-term cellular immune response. Vaccines produced by this method include the injectable form of the influenza vaccine, uh, the inactivated polio vaccine or IPV, and the rabies and hepatitis A vaccines. Subunit vaccines are made from antigenic fragments of bacteria or viruses, uh, thereby avoiding the risk associated with alive or killed pathogens. Um, several of these fragments can be combined into structures we call virus-like particles 
that resemble viruses but lack any genetic material. Furthermore, these particles can be produced on a large scale by introducing genes that code for the fragments into a microorganism such as a bacterium or a yeast, which can easily be grown in the laboratory to produce large numbers of these fragments. Vaccines made by this method are termed recombinant vaccines. Subunit vaccines are incapable of producing disease, and in the case of virus-like particles, they can stimulate strong B cell and T cell immune responses. However, typical subunit vaccines are not as immunogenic and require booster doses to build immunity. Hepatitis B and the human papillomavirus vaccines are examples of subunit vaccines. Conjugate vaccines were created to prevent infection by bacteria that produce a sugar-like outer coating called a, outer coating, excuse me, called a capsule. Combining a portion of this capsule with a protein that elicits a strong immune response, such as inactivated bacterial toxins we call toxoids, makes this a useful vaccine, particularly for infants whose immune systems are of course not yet fully developed. Conjugate vaccines stimulate the T cell response to bacteria capsules and have made the vaccine against Haemophilus influenzae type B possible for infants as young as two months. H flu, as the bacterium is known, is the causative agent of a number of dangerous childhood diseases, including severe pneumonias and meningitis. Uh, just as toxoids are used to enhance the effectiveness of viruses against bacteria with capsules, these inactivated toxins can be used to immunize against diseases caused by bacteria that produce the toxins. The tetanus and diphtheria toxoids have long been used as part of the childhood vaccination regimen. A series of injections and booster doses are often required for these vaccines that are made from toxoids. The DTAP series, which protects against diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, also known as whooping cough, and the vaccine that protects against pneumococcal pneumonia are made using toxoids. A relatively new and promising method for creating vaccines is to use a portion of the pathogen's DNA or messenger RNA to create pathogen proteins using our own cells. The genetic material from a virus, for example, is encapsulated into little lipid nanoparticles, and these lipid nanoparticles are injected into muscle. Because of their fatty acid nature, these lipid vectors fuse easily with the plasma membrane of our own cells. The DNA or messenger RNA from the virus is then released into the interior of the cell and the host cell begins to make viral proteins that are coded for by the viral nucleic acid. These protein antigens are then expressed on the cell surface where our immune, where our immune system can detect them and make neutralizing antibodies against them. There are currently no approved human vaccines made by the nucleic acid method but a high profile effort by Moderna, a US biotech company to create COVID vaccine using messenger RNA is currently underway. So in closing, I'd like to mention that out of the hundred or so vaccines for COVID-19 currently in development worldwide, several promising high profile candidates have made their way to the front of the pack. Now five of these candidate, five, excuse me, five of these vaccine development programs are shown on the next two slides. So first let's look at Moderna. As I mentioned, it's a US biotech firm. They're developing a vaccine based on the nucleic acid method we described. They use SARS-CoV-2 messenger RNA to induce human cells to express, to express viral proteins that will stimulate the immune system to produce neutralizing antibodies. Phase three trials of this vaccine with 30,000 participants are scheduled to start this July. CanSino Biologics, a Chinese biotech company, uses an adenovirus vector to deliver SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins. The adenovirus is the virus that causes the common cold. By delivering the SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins in this manner, the company hopes to elicit immune response by this recombinant subunit vaccine method. Now, the company is currently in phase two trials of this vaccine.
Uh, likewise, a high-profile, well-funded collaborative effort between AstraZeneca and the University of Oxford is underway to develop a recombinant adenovirus vaccine using the subunit method as well to elicit an immune response to SARS, excuse me, to SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins. Cinevac Biotech is another Chinese company attempting to develop a COVID vaccine. Uh, they decided to use the traditional inactivated whole virus method uh, to make their vaccine. Finally, Inovio Pharmaceuticals, a biotech company located in Pennsylvania, is using the nucleic acid vaccine method as a platform for developing effective COVID vaccine. Inovio's approach is to use SARS-CoV-2 RNA to deliver genetic instructions to the cell for building viral proteins that stimulate the immune response. This technology has worked in the past to create two vaccines approved for veterinary use, one to prevent canine melanoma, I didn't know that they had melanoma, and the other to prevent West Nile virus infections in horses. So I think I'll stop here and return the screen to Taylor and Devin, um, who I believe are planning to open up a, a panel discussion to take questions from the audience. Uh, but I wanna thank um, everyone for uh, listening and I hope you got something out of that lecture. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Grimm. Um, we are gonna take a few minutes at this point for the, the panel who is here to ask a couple of questions. And I think Dr. Newton is going to get us started with that. Sure. Um, so uh, I had a I had a question um, myself um, this week. Um, an individual uh, who was participating in Moderna's trial, uh, he came forth to talk about a, a negative systematic reaction that he experienced as a part of that trial. Um, and part of his message was that I still believe in it, even though I had this negative response. So I, I suppose the question that I have, uh, especially I believe, is Moderna using the, I'm just trying to take my note, they're, they're using the nucleic acid method, the nucleic acid method? Yes, Dr. yes, Grimm? they are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that you mentioned about that is that you, you're not supposed to get sick from it. So um, what's the difference between being sick with the virus and a systematic response like this individual experience? And how do we know? How do we know it's safe? Well, uh, thanks for the question, uh, Taylor. It's my understanding that um, in this study, this is a phase one study, and they had uh, 45 people involved in the study. And Moderna apparently had recorded four participants um, who, are, who experienced what we call grade three adverse events. These are side effects that are severe or medically significant, but not life-threatening. Uh, the person I think that you're talking about ran a fever of 102, 103, something like that, and experienced a fainting episode. Uh, those symptoms lasted only one day and he, and he felt much better. I think that this is typical of phase one trials in which the company uh, tries out different doses of the, um, the new vaccine. Uh, trying to find the right dose that will afford protection but not cause harm to health. Uh, the volunteer who experienced that adverse event was um, one of three or four in that group, I believe, who received the highest dose of vaccine, and they all experienced kind of similar reactions. So I'm not surprised at all that in phase one trials where they're trying to get the dose correct that you have, uh, especially with the high doses, a few adverse reactions like that. And I was happy that um, I think all the participants that experienced those adverse reactions recovered quite well. And the company knows now that that's a little too high a dose. I think they're striving to get the most um, or the biggest immune response they can without giving the patient so much of the vaccine that they generate these adverse events. Thanks, that's helpful to know. Um, sometimes having people people who are experts in this area like you and Dr. Ush, uh, who can kind of make me feel better about my fears and anxieties. <laughs> well, I'd like to add something to that as well. Um, this is one of the reasons why uh, placebo control trials are so important. Uh, many of the phase one trials are not placebo controlled. So any adverse reaction could be mistakenly attributed to treatment induced. Now, in only to figure out whether this systematic or systemic reaction that this specific patient uh, experienced, the incidence of that in both the placebo group uh, 
and the treatment group needs to be established. And that's why many of you know, the numbers in phase two and phase three would probably resolve that uh, question. Great. You know, I'm, I'm a social scientist, a little bit of a different realm. I appreciate the importance of recognizing base rates, but it's still uh, something that I have to kind of take a step back and wrap my head around um, because the thought is always in the back of my mind. What if it's me? What if it's my kids? Um, but but it's important to, to be a little bit more objective in our approach. Wouldn't you agree, Dr. Ash and Dr. Grimm? Yes, and it's, it's good to be cautious as well. Yes, and I think we're going to see um, adverse events for every vaccine out there. But if we can keep it something like uh, out of uh, 300,000 people vaccinated, you get um, 200 adverse events and they are relatively mild. And, you know, I think that we're uh, well on our way to having a great vaccine. That's neat. One of the things that have a, oh, sorry, Dr. Fisher. I was gonna say, there's a question that just came in on the chat line that, that really is a good follow-up to this. And it's the, the question of um, how likely it is that any one of these viruses will be sufficient, or are there gonna be differences in the, the host that are gonna require different types of vaccinations? You know, it, it, again, as an English professor, that's so far beyond my kind of knowledge that I, I, I will turn that over to you. Dr. Ash, why don't you speak to that, please? Okay. Um, one of the concerns, you know, with say with influenza vaccine and why we need a seasonal, new seasonal vaccine is that the mutation rate of influenza vaccines or influenza virus is uh, pretty high. So every year, a new strain, if you will, of influenza. Uh, is what we're exposed to. So it requires a new vaccine every year. Uh, luckily with the coronaviruses, they're relatively stable, meaning I think there's only two or three variants, uh, genetic variants that have been uh, detected. And the spike protein, if the, vac if the uh, vaccine is directed against the spike protein antigen, we find that that's one of the more stable proteins because if they mutated on the spike protein, it would probably make them less effective. So I think uh, that concern is not as great uh, as with other viral infections like uh, influenza. Dr. Esch, the, the common cold, um, is that a coronavirus or, or Dr. Grimm mentioned that's an adenovirus, right? With a different shape, is that correct? Well, there's actually, when we say the common cold, we refer to multiple viruses, coronaviruses, adenoviruses, and even uh, uh, RSV, or there are other rhinoviruses, uh, another group that account for these common cold uh, symptoms. Famously, there's no vaccination for any, is it true that for any of those classes of causes for the common cold that there's no vaccination. Why? And why do we think that coronavirus might be different? Well, because of the severe, one is the severity of the coronavirus uh, symptoms. Uh, adenovirus, the other common colds, like other coronaviruses that cause the common cold are usually restricted to the upper respiratory tract. They don't invade the uh, bronchi like the COVID-19 that has specific uh, spikes against the ACE2 receptors, which are plentiful in the lungs. So uh, even though they belong to the same class of coronaviruses, they're not as invasive as the COVID-19 strain. Uh, adenoviruses are common amongst, you know, uh, grade school children, and uh, in the military. So vaccines are available, but they're relatively um, uh, not in wide distribution. So gotcha. it doesn't cause severe disease like COVID-19. I think that's the reason. Thanks. So speaking of the, the severity of the disease, this question comes from Mason Seegers. Um, and he notes that you mentioned several different types of viruses. So the adenovirus and envelope viruses. Does the type of virus have an effect on the severity of it or how contagious it is? 
Um, actually, there are uh, enveloped and non-enveloped viruses um, that are responsible for a severe disease. So the type of virus um, uh, could also be uh, described as RNA or DNA viruses. And there are um, RNA and DNA viruses that cause severe disease. Uh, and then if you uh, further um, uh, separate viruses based on their capsid structure, for example, or their helical viruses, or their uh, polyhedral, uh, those kind of viruses enveloped, um, all those types of viruses uh, are capable of uh, producing different severe diseases. So uh, I think the answer to Mason's question is that it really doesn't matter the category that the virus is, is, is put in, uh, whether it's enveloped or non-enveloped, RNA or DNA, uh, there's uh, plenty of um, uh, bad news for um, uh, viral infections in humans. I had another question uh, about science kind of generally. Um, the science that I know in my discipline anyway is pretty slow moving when it's at its best. Um, so there are studies um, with as many people as possible in them and then other scientists come along and do replications of those studies and it's only over the course of time uh, that enough of a consensus in the scientific community is built before we can rely on something as kind of a, a known quantity. But this, this is forcing things to move fast. And I'm, I wonder if things are breaking a little bit. Um, there was a little bit of news today about that same Moderna trial that we were just talking about and that Dr. Grimm introduced, um, that some of the data behind that first, uh, some of the first studies wasn't reliable, and that based on a single study, uh, the WHO changed their recommendations, and some countries changed their recommended course of treatment on the basis of single studies. Can you talk a little bit about uh, science moving quickly and how do we know that we can feel good about findings from studies when it's moving so fast? And if I may build on that, actually, a question came in from, uh, I believe it was Tyson just here, who has some concerns that I have shared a little bit, which is the, the race to move quickly, also driven by funding concerns and, and investor concerns. Uh, so these big biotech companies that are, are responsible to shareholders are we rushing it, I guess, is the question. Uh, Dr. Ash, I think you have an, a strong opinion about this, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a luxury to be a scientist and uh, base all your decisions on well-controlled, evidence-based uh, medicine. So, but when we have an epidemic or a pandemic, that luxury you know, seems to be uh, put aside based on the risk versus benefit. And I think that is one of the reasons we're seeing this accelerated pace of development, um, cutting corners in the opinion of some scientists, uh, especially um, the rate at which some of these trials that you mentioned, Dan, that are going on, I mean, entering phase three after what, uh, less than six months after uh, sequencing the virus's uh, genome? That's totally unheard of. Uh, and it's not possible without these shortcuts. One is probably combining phase one and two trials, in other words, safety and um, maybe the dosing trials, combining dosing and efficacy trials with this small, uh, number of subjects in entering phase three uh, right away. So that saves several months of normal development work, uh, you know, and put maybe putting aside and not putting emphasis on that systemic reaction that you mentioned and, uh, and just sort of bet on that not showing up later on. But that's the gamble that I think we have to take when we have a exceptional case like a disease uh, responsible for a pandemic. It's just, I think, a risk versus benefit um, calculation that we scientists have to make uh, before accelerating you know, the timetable. Well, if I could uh, add to that as well, um, 
maybe some of you saw uh, or heard about um, Dr. Anthony Fauci's uh, interview with the American Medical Association on Tuesday, I believe it was, where he predicted that we'd have 200 million doses of COVID vaccine by the beginning of next year, by January 2021. And um, when he was asked about how this is going to happen, he mentioned that it's likely to come from Moderna. Uh, they start their phase three trials in July, and they're taking a risk, a financial risk, uh, by unless something um, early in phase three stops them, it's my understanding that they're going to um, go ahead and generate uh, millions of doses of this vaccine in hopes that everything in phase three works out. So they're taking risks because if they do have issues in phase three testing that prevents the distribution of the vaccine, then they're out all those doses that they made. But if phase three works, then they've saved months of time by going ahead and making all these doses of vaccines instead of waiting till the end of phase three to make sure everything worked out before they started vaccine production. So I don't know if that's um, so much a shortcut or um, this, um, you know, coincidental um, uh, manufacture of vaccines during the time that phase three is um, going on is going to help us all. It might be a great thing for us. It's just too early to tell. And, and also along those lines of accelerating, the technology in which the vaccine is based has a significant impact. For instance, the Moderna vaccine is an mRNA uh, uh, vaccine, which is very easy to mass produce in vitro by synthetic uh, uh, molecular biology. Whereas say an attenuated virus takes years to mutate the virus uh, in tissue cultures or in eggs uh, and mutating the virus step-by-step step to preserve its infectivity, but reduce its pathogenicity. And so it's a long, it takes sometimes years to develop an attenuated strain before you can even test them in humans. So this DNA, RNA, new technology in itself is at least accelerating the manufacturing obstacles that traditional vaccines have experienced in the past. Oh, that's absolutely right. I mean, even if you grow a vaccine or, or grow a virus in tissue culture, let's say you're making a subunit vaccine, uh, you've got to grow large amounts of the virus in subculture. You have to purify that virus. You have to figure out a way to break it up and then to purify the uh, viral fragments that you're going to use to make a subunit vaccine. And all that takes a whole lot of time before you can even go into phase one. Uh, but when you're using an, an mRNA vaccine or a DNA vaccine, uh, like you said, all you have to do is select a portion of that uh, genome uh, that's going to code for a particular protein and uh, then inject that into our muscle cells to make that protein and then have our immune system react to it. So the, the timeline is much reduced on those nucleic acid vaccines. So I should jump in here with an apology to um, Michael Boone, who was actually the person who asked the question about the pharmaceutical companies. Great question. Tyson had another great question, though, and it's one that's been um, showing up a number of times in the, the Q&A session tonight. And that, that deals with the virus mutations and what impact that's going to have on the, the effort to create a vaccination for it. I think that's one of the big questions that we have. Thus far, as I said, there's only two or three mutants that have been sequenced. But once it gets into this new reservoir, I mean, when it was an animal reservoir before it was you know, transferred to humans. But now that it's fermenting, if you will, in the human population, what is the mutation rate going to be as we transmit this between humans? That's totally unknown. Uh, the diagnostic tests that we have, the PCR tests, are only looking at for the current strains. So I think it would take a while, maybe one or two seasons, one or two years before we can establish the true mutation rate once it establishes itself in the human uh, population. But that's a big question that uh, 
we all have about this virus. Kind of building building on that idea of our own body's responses to the virus. Um, so the New York Times reported today on a study that was not peer reviewed um, that suggested that there were some genetic markers that might make some people more susceptible to COVID-19 in a way that other people are not. Uh, it had something to do with blood type. Uh, type A blood led to a 50% greater chance of severe symptoms. Um, what is it typical for some people to have more enhanced immune responses to to something like this? And um, it, it, will that change the, the course of treatment that different people with different susceptibilities would seek out? And that echoes a question or two that's been in here as uh, in the Q&A feed as well, which is just if you could say a little bit about what causes the severity of a virus. Why is it that the common cold makes me feel icky for a couple of days, but something like the, the COVID-19 virus will potentially be far more severe. Well, that, that's both a feature of the, of the virulence of the virus, you know, how virulent is it? And of course, the other side of the coin is our immunity uh, to it. Now, I, I haven't heard about this um, you know, blood type, but it's, been well known that genetic markers, especially the, the major histocompatibility complex, which are, or the HLA genes, which are used for tissue transplants. These are the transplantation genes, similar to the blood group, that is directly associated in our ability to respond to certain pathogens. So there's been uh, one paper already amongst uh, COVID-19 uh, infected individuals and looking at the severity of the disease. And there was certain HLA genotypes or your histocompatibility you know, genes that was directly associated with the severity, which was expected. But this blood group test, you know, I haven't, read this paper yet. This must be a fairly new um, suggestion. I believe so. But, uh, yeah, so, but um, I would like to read that paper because I would like to look at the statistical correlation of this association with severity. Now it could be statistically significant, but I would uh, venture to uh, uh, be suspicious on its clinical significance. So there's a difference there. I don't know how many subjects it was, but uh, I'll be looking out for that paper. But HLA typing is definitely a genetic marker for severity in response to not just viral infections, but all kinds of uh, pathogen related disease. Do you think differences in, um, in our inherent, our native immunity is what's behind these asymptomatic carriers? What's explaining the pattern that we're seeing, do you think? I'm sure that's one role. Our, our genetic uh, immune response genes, if you will, is definitely a part. And of course, the virulence of the invader, <laughs> the invading virus is another. Uh, underlying health effects have been associated with this. The ACE2 receptor, interestingly, is also, uh, you know, it's called the angiotensin uh, uh, converting enzyme, which there are drugs, people on medication, especially blood pressure medication that influences and targets this receptor could have a underlying uh, effect on response to COVID-19 infections. So, and then, other underlying medical uh, or environmental or dietary uh, uh, conditions can influence how you respond. So there's several uh, you know, genetic and non-genetic influences on how you respond to a disease. We've got a number of questions coming through uh, about testing for um, COVID-19. Um, some questions about what might cause false positives or false negatives. Is it possible that other vaccinations or other recent viruses would cause that? And I'm wondering if either of you might say anything about 
the process of how we go about identifying whether someone has had this virus already. Well, I can speak a, a little to that. I know that um, there are uh, people who um, are concerned about the accuracy of the test to begin with. Um, there are uh, literally hundreds of these uh, tests out there and the FDA has uh, had to clamp down on uh, those tests. The FDA now requires that um, those tests have to be authorized by the FDA to, be, to remain on the market. Uh, and some of these tests are, are relatively fast. Abbott's got um, uh, a test, um, I think theirs is an antibody test and returns results in as little as five minutes. Um, uh, but due to an influx of potentially unreliable serological antibody tests coming to market, the FDA has clamped down on these. Uh, now, in terms of uh, interactions of these tests, the false positives and false negatives, uh, the FDA also has um, accuracy and reproducibility requirements uh, for the rate of correctly detecting positive samples. Uh, so if you had um, 100 sera samples, for example, and they were all positive, um, your test needs to come up with 90% of those um, uh, correctly predicted positive. And the negative sample, I believe, is even uh, greater. You have to have a 95% uh, correct um, rate for uh, testing negative samples. So there's, um, uh, for the FDA to authorize something, and again, things are moving very fast, and I just have to uh, maybe uh, mistakenly rely on the FDA's expertise in this area to make sure that we have accurate tests. But I am glad that they have uh, kind of uh, clamp down on the number of tests that are out there, many of which are unreliable. And uh, Dr. Esch may be able to speak to cross-reactivity uh, a little bit in these tests as well. Yeah, um, to add to that, the, the, th this is again, in my opinion, another example of how evidence-based gold bar um, development of, in this case, diagnostic, tests, we need to sacrifice, you know, accuracy, especially when we're introducing these tests in the middle of a pandemic or an epidemic. And so in some ways, I think that as these tests are introduced and the FDA is not really approving them, they're giving them a waiver to use them. Uh, if their sensitivity is sufficient, even if it's a false positive, in this case, it's better to have a false positive than a false negative. So based on that, uh, as time goes on and we establish these banks of true positives and true negatives, we'll be able to sort through these tests, refine them, and I think they'll just get better and better as they're being, it's like having a phase three trial in the midst of this epidemic which in, in, in one way will accelerate their, uh, their utility. One of the things uh, that's been most consistent in the messaging from the scientific community from the very beginning was about hand washing. I recall even a, a viral video of a little hamster like washing its hands at like a tiny little sink and it was adorable. Um, but I wondered if uh, that piece of advice, if you could shed a little bit more light from a virology perspective, what exactly are we doing? Why the 20 seconds? What exactly are we doing when we wash with soap and water? This was a question that we had emailed in to us uh, in advance of the class from uh, Matt in Asheville. Well, we're doing a couple of things when we wash our hands with soap and water. Uh, one thing we're doing is um, we're removing particles uh, using soap and soap will emulsify fats, break them down into uh, tiny particles that we can get rid of. Uh, the other thing is that with uh, the COVID virus, it's an envelope virus. That envelope is made of lipids. Lipids are fats, fatty acids and fatty acids are um, solubilized in uh, soap and water. So when you have soap, it actually destroys um, the uh, envelope around the coronavirus. And when that envelope is gone, uh, there's no binding. So even if you didn't get rid of the virus, if you got rid of the envelope, the virus would be unable to bind to the host cell. So uh, the same thing can um, be accomplished if you use alcohol-based um, hand sanitizers because lipids are also soluble in alcohol and the alcohol will dissolve that um, 
uh, envelope that surrounds the uh, capsid of the coronavirus and another way to destroy the virus so that it, it no longer binds to host cells. I'd like to go first say thank you for that answer, but I, I want to go way back to the beginning of this. Um, I always like to make sure that we get in the questions that are about the materials that we posted before the webinar. Um, and Norma asked one of our first questions tonight, and I just hadn't found a way to work it into the conversation. She asks um, if you could say more about immune enhancement. Um, you mentioned it in your video, Dr. Grimm, but then um, Norma's asking if you can explain a little more fully what that means. Um, there's um, actually a term called uh, immune enhancement um, that refers to, um, and I'm not sure where we saw that, and maybe it's in the, one of the videos I uh, posted, but there's a, um, a phenomenon of, of immune enhancement where if you're um, uh, given a, a vaccine, for example, uh, if you, you may, uh, under certain circumstances, actually uh, be more uh, prone to getting the disease that you're being vaccinated against. Now, that's one um, a definition I've seen of immune enhancement. Uh, Dr. Esch, is that, um, does that fit along with uh, your understanding of that term as well? Yeah, I, I think you're referring to disease enhancement. I think it's called vaccine-induced disease enhancement, which is a phenomenon where actual vaccination predisposes the recipient of the vaccine to have more severe um, reactions to the, say in this case, the virus than otherwise, uh, even if they were unprotected. And that was shown in the 1960s with a uh, vaccine raised against the respiratory syncytial virus or the RSV, which is another cold virus and measles. And they had to discontinue the trial. And when they looked at this, the population that showed this severe response, that it was associated with a certain kind of inflammatory response, uh, so-called TH2 response, which is very similar to the, the cytokine storm phenomenon that we're actually seeing in COVID, uh, uh, some COVID patients. And it, my, uh, Hypothesis is that there, there could be an underlying genetic marker, such as the HLA or a, another immune uh, response gene that predisposes people to respond to vaccination in this inflammatory, with this inflammatory uh, uh, leaning response. So it's, it's not known but certain kinds of vaccines like RSV and measles uh, was associated with this, whereas others have not. And this is another reason why these phase three trials, I think will reveal you know, the risk of inducing this disease of enhancing response to vaccination. Thank you for enhancing my answer, Dr. Ash. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. So we are, rapidly approaching the eight o'clock hour. There are unfortunately a lot of really great questions still in the Q&A that we're not gonna have time to get to. And we do sincerely apologize. We wish that we had a way to fit all of this nicely into the one hour. Uh, we would encourage you to, to check out the YouTube video that will be posted and you can put some questions there. I wanna say a big thank you to Dr. Grimm and to Dr. Esch. Um, you, the two of you have talked about the coronavirus in a way that I have not heard before. Um, I, I've been spending a lot of time reading the news, um, watching the news, and we certainly hear a lot about the coronavirus, but never in the kind of scientific way that you have presented it to us tonight. So thank you. Um, I suspect that like me, all of you have been watching the news and uh, Dr. Newton, how might we address that? 
<laughs> I'm so glad you asked, Dr. Fisher. Uh, well, next week we are going to be joined by uh, Professor Dr. Jeff Jeffrey Delbert. Uh, he is a professor of communication here at LR and has a particular interest in political communication. And he spends time thinking about uh, what makes communication effective and what hinders accurate communication. So he's going to be talking to us about misinformation and handling the onslaught of information that we're faced with day after day. How do you how do you discern uh, the wheat from the chaff uh, in, in that news? So I'm really excited for next week, too, as much as I've also enjoyed Dr. Esch and Dr. Grimm joining us here tonight. And we will have materials from Dr. Delbert posted hopefully sometime Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening. We will send you an email when that material is up and we look forward to learning more with you as the summer goes on. Thank you again, Dr. Grimm and Dr. Ash. Thank you guys, appreciate it. Thanks very much. And I will end.